For the past couple of weeks, we have been in this series called Masks. And what we've been talking about is taking off the mask that hinders us from our relationship with God. For example, uh, we have read in Scripture that if you cover your sin, then you will not prosper. If you try to hide, you won't prosper. Uh, the Bible tells us to confess our sins to one another and we'll be healed. We'll be able to prosper. We'll be better off. And so we've been talking about taking off the masks. Stop hiding behind masks. We talked about the mask of fear. We all have fears. We talked about the mask of anxiety last week. And today, I'm going to talk about a very important mask. And um, it's probably going to cut a little close today, if you know what I'm talking about. It's like a close shave. This message is probably going to convict every one of us today. And here's the topic, the title, Taking Off the Mask of Pride. Now, pride is the original sin. If you've read in Scripture, you know that Lucifer was in heaven. He was an archangel, and he was in charge of worship. But in pride, he was lifted up. He said, I will, I will. And God immediately, because of his sin, kicked him out of heaven. If you've read in Genesis, you know that the story of creation with Adam and Eve, remember the original sin that the serpent, the devil, tempted them with? Uh, he said, has God really said you shouldn't eat of that tree? And he said, God knows that when you eat of it, you'll be like God. Pride, the original sin. And pride is a bigger problem than we like to admit. In fact, it is more important that we deal with this in our life than just about anything else. And I'm going to show you this from Scripture today. Pride keeps you from coming to God. I cannot tell you the number of times I've talked to people in my life, in my ministry, where pride is what kept them from coming to Jesus. I've seen people that pride kept them from receiving Christ. Where I grew up, Right across the street from me, there was a man, and uh, he lived to be 99 years old. He was a farmer, and my dad and I would go talk to this man. His name was Gil White, and I'll never forget sitting on his porch one day. My dad was sharing the gospel with him, and the, the man said, look, I read the Bible every day, and he did, and he was very serious about this, and he said, I've come to the conclusion that there's no hope. And this man, in his pride, as far as I know, never received Christ. It kept him from coming to God. Pride keeps you from admitting that you're wrong. We all deal with that, right? We all like to be right. Nobody likes to be wrong. Uh, pride keeps you from confessing your sins. Pride keeps you from resolving arguments. And in fact, the greatest message ever preached in history, in the history of the world, was preached by Jesus. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And you've, you know how it starts. You remember the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, that word poor, the idea there is not just like, hey, I'm broke, can I borrow five bucks? That's not what he's talking about. The word meant to be completely broken, completely helpless, and unless someone else acted on your behalf, there was no hope for you. Now, what was Jesus saying? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Once again, he was not talking about um, your physical body. He was not even talking about your emotions. He was talking about your spiritual attitude of understanding that if you don't humble yourself and come before God, there is no hope for you to have a relationship with God. Blessed are those who humble themselves, those that admit that they cannot do it themselves, those that know that they're not strong enough, they're not good enough. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Pride is a mask we hide behind. It keeps us from healing relationships. And the truth is, every one of us struggles with pride. No matter how meek you may feel or seem, we all deal with pride. Uh, it is a part of our sin nature. And so, what do you do with pride? Uh, just give you an example of this, my, of how pride hurts you. Um, 
when I graduated college, Kim and I graduated the same year. We, in a two-week period, we graduated from college. We got married. We went on our honeymoon. We moved into our first apartment, and I started my first job as a youth pastor in Panama City, Florida. I know, tough job, but somebody's got to do it, right? So there we were, and uh, I was, I just, we just graduated from college, and you know how it is. Uh, ladies, let me let you in on a secret for your man. Uh, the older he gets, the better he was, all right, and, uh, and all kinds of things. Now, I played sports uh, all throughout my life, up to that point especially, and so I was, um, shall I say, filled with pride. 6'1", weighed about 195 pounds, would love to take off my shirt and show you my abs. You know, that kind of idiot, you know, at 21 years of age. I was so full of myself. Uh, we moved there, and a guy who became my best friend, his name was Dean Weingartner. And how shall I describe Dean? I was tall and athletic, and he was vertically challenged. I'll say it that way. And uh, he was horizontally enhanced. Do you know what I'm talking about? In other words, he was short and fat, all right? So, and he did not look athletic. Um, he was not very athletic. He didn't even look like he could chew gum and walk at the same time to me. But he said to me, and I'll never forget this, he said, Richie, would you like to go play racquetball? And I'm like, well, I don't really know what racquetball is. I've never played it, but yes. I'd like to go play racquetball. So he arranged it. He let me borrow some equipment. And I started learning a little bit about racquetball. And because I was young and dumb and full of pride, I decided that I was going to make this interesting. Because after all, I just graduated college. I'd played sports, uh, you know, I played soccer and, and basketball in college. I was full of myself. And here is this guy. I mean, you know, there's no way that he could be very athletic or very good at any sport, right? So I challenged him. I said, Dean, here's what we're going to do. Not only are we going to play racquetball, whoever loses has to buy uh, our wives and us a meal at the best restaurant in town. Now, if you're familiar with Panama City, um, they've got a place there called Captain Anderson's, which is very good if you've ever been there or at the time at least Angelo's Steak Pit very nice restaurants and very good food, but also pricey, all right? And so I was just 21 years old, didn't have a lot of money, but I was so proud of myself. And so on that day, I'll never forget it. We got there. I'm so confident. I mean, the fact is, I was just tasting the steak from Angelo's Steak Pit, right? And uh, we got there, and the first game, I'm so proud to report to you, uh, that the score was 21 to nothing, and I had the nothing, all right? That, I mean, I had not a single point. We played three games, and I scored one point in the entire... Now, how could that possibly happen? Here I was, young. I was, at least I thought, athletic against a guy that didn't look athletic at all, and yet he demolished me. What does that say? Well, I tell you what it tells us is that pride hurts us. I'm going to make this statement, and you may not agree with it, but once I show you from Scripture what the Bible says, I think you will agree with it. Pride is our greatest problem. Now, you may think, well, you know, our problem, our greatest problem is the devil. No, pride's more of a problem than the devil. Now, I realize that we often blame things on the devil, right? The devil made me do it. That's just the way I am. I'm a victim of circumstance, right? But our greatest problem is not the devil. Our greatest problem is not low self-esteem. Now, I know some people think that's the greatest problem. But pride is much, much of a greater problem than low self-esteem. Some think that our upbringing or injustice. And we could go on down the list, but the point is, here's what God tells us to do. God wants us to kill our pride before it kills us. In fact, we're going to have this on the screen. I want you to say it out loud together with me. God wants me to kill my pride before it kills me. All right? Now, I know you're being humble because you didn't want to be uh, louder than your neighbor, but let's actually say that out loud together. 
and pretend that you can actually read. Okay, so uh, God wants me to kill my pride before it kills me. Now you say, where do you get that from? Well, let me read to you from Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah was an Old Testament prophet, and uh, God really used him. And I want you to hear what God told Jeremiah to tell the nation of Israel, the Israelites. Here's what he said. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. I, I want to show you three ways from this text how that we can kill our pride before it kills us. How we can deal with our pride. And here's the first point. God wants me to believe his word. Notice what it began with, thus says the Lord. And then the last phrase, declares the Lord. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that God's word is critical to our life. Not just in dealing with pride, but in every part of our life. Without the word of God, we don't know who God is or what he's like or how he loves us or how to relate to him. Without God's word, we don't know the gospel. Without God's word, we don't get to know Jesus. Without God's word, we don't have instruction for living. We don't have wisdom that the Word of God gives us. We don't have the way that we should live. We don't have correction in our lives. We don't know how we should live without the Word of God. And yet, for many Christians, the Word of God is a struggle for them. Not necessarily that they believe it, but the fact that it's difficult sometimes to read it. Sometimes it's difficult in our schedule to include that. But let me just tell you, that if you want to deal with the problems in your life, if you want to have a closer relationship with God, if you want to be what God wants you to be, if you want to have wisdom, listen very closely, you got to have the Word of God in your life. Now, how do we do that? Well, we do it by going to church, obviously listening to the Word of God preach, but also by reading the Word of God, or at least listening to it. And I've told you this time and time again. Uh, there really is no excuse for any of us not to get the Word of God on a regular basis in our life. If you have a phone, a smartphone or an iPhone, you can download the Bible app. And you know what I did this morning on the way uh, to church? I listened to 10 chapters from the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, I wasn't reading it while I was driving, okay? But I just put it on my phone, played it, and I listened to it, okay? There is no way that you and I should not be able to get the Word of God into our life on a regular basis. Uh, you say, well, I don't like to read. Well, let it read it to you. In fact, you know that throughout history, most people, by hearing the Word of God, they didn't read it. They didn't own a copy of Scripture. They didn't, uh, many of them couldn't even read. And so how they got the Word of God in their life was through hearing it. And so the Word of God is very, very important. It has great power. Without the Word of God, uh, I won't be able to kill the pride in my life. Now, let me just say this. Pride hinders your relationship with God. Once again, pride is what caused the problem in the Garden of Eden. The Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, began with that very declaration that the pathway to God, the beginning of a relationship with God, does not start with pride, but it starts with humility. And so, Psalm 10, 4 says, the wicked do not care about the Lord in their pride, there it is, in their pride, they think that God doesn't matter. Now, let me just give you what Jesus said. You remember this, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. For they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't make my top 10 list of sins. How many are going to eat today? Raise your hand. How many are going to drink something today? And I'm not talking about getting drunk on alcohol. I'm talking about you got to drink some sweet tea or whatever, or soda or water, whatever. Eating and drinking, in other words, they're existing, they're living. And uh, how many are married in here? Raise your hand. How many of you have a son or a daughter who's married? Raise your hand. All right, a lot of you. 
Uh, how many of you, your mom or dad, helped with your wedding? Raise your hand. All right. Look, the bottom line is this. Marrying and giving in marriage is a wonderful thing. In fact, God tells us that's a wonderful thing. God performed the first wedding. So what was the problem? They were eating and they were drinking and they were marrying and they were giving in marriage. Where is the sin, Jesus? It's not the sin of commission. It's the sin of omission. Here's the problem. It wasn't what they were doing. It's what they were not doing. They had no room for God in their life. Just like the verse that we read, uh, in their pride, they think that God doesn't matter. Uh, I've used this term before. I, it's not original with me. I've read it from another pastor. And he used this term, Christian atheists. He said, well, that's an oxymoron. You can't really have a Christian atheist. Well, his description was, they believe in God, they just live like he doesn't exist. They believe in God, but they live like they don't believe that they're going to answer to him one day. And there are a lot of people that live that way. And according to what we just read, our pride is what causes us to have this barrier between us and God. We're too proud to introspect. We're too proud to look at our own life. We're too proud to take um, a look inside of what we're doing. We're too proud to do that. So what happens? We just, we believe in God. And in fact, if somebody asks, oh yes, I love God. I love him a lot. I love Jesus. We just act like he doesn't exist. We treat each day as if he's not the one that's in charge, that he's not the creator, that he is not the sustainer of life. We act as if he's not there. And it's our pride. So God hates pride. James 4, 4 and 6, it says, this is from the message paraphrase, and I love this. He says, you're cheating on God. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God in his way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? This proverb has it that he is a fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love is far greater than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud and God gives grace to the willing humble. God hates pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So the word of God, my first step, if I'm going to deal with my pride, I've got to get the word of God in my life. I've got to admit to God that I need help. I've got to admit to God that pride is my problem. And my relationship with God, I've got to understand that I must turn to God for help because I can't do it on my own. If you leave here today and you think what you heard me say was that you need to go work harder, that you need to be more disciplined, that you need to just buckle down and try harder, you've completely missed the point that I'm trying to make. Now, I'm not against discipline, and I'm certainly not against trying hard, but what the Bible is clear here about our relationship with God is this. If you think you can do it on your own, that's pride. If you think you don't need God's help, that's pride. And God says, I will give grace to those who are willing to admit that. And so what we need is God's grace. Let me give you the second thought. God wants me to be aware of pride. Now, not aware as in I just want to study it, but he wants to be us to be aware of what pride does in our life. We got to get the Word of God in our life. Then we need to be aware of pride. Now let's look back at our text. He said, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, and let not the rich man boast in his riches. And here's what he's saying. Beware of trusting in your own perspective and wisdom. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. You ever just think you got it all figured out? You ever just tell God your plans and he kind of laughs? Listen to what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never rely on what you think you know. Good night. What do you think you know? There are a lot of things. The younger, when I was a young man, I had, I could have been called the answer man. Because I had answers. I knew what you should do. Didn't matter if I had any experience of that or not. I knew the answer. I knew that I was right. 
I'm 59 years old now. I've got a lot of life experience under my belt. And I figured out that I don't know much at all, <laughs> you know. You ever just try to depend on what you think you know? Now, let me ask you this question. Who would you trust? The person that couldn't see because they have limited sight, limited vision, the limited ability to know what was going on, or the person that could see everything? Well, I'm going to trust the one that can see all. And so why would I think that my perspective, my wisdom is better than God's? God not only knows all, he sees all. He, he sees you. Let, let me kind of explain this so you get it. Um, the reason that God is eternal is because he is outside of time and space. You know that God is not waiting for your life to happen. He already sees it. He already knows it. The Bible is pretty clear about this, that before we were ever born, God knew us. He saw us in our mother's womb. He sees the future. He sees the past. And so what God is, God is not looking at his watch up at heaven and saying, boy, I sure do hope that Richie will be here soon. That's not what he's doing. He sees all and knows all. So why would I trust my own perspective rather than God's perspective? Because he already knows it all. He already sees it all. If you have kids and you're a good parent, you have somewhat of a limited experience with this, right? Uh, each of my kids, Kim and I have three kids, they're all adults now. Um, every one of my kids, when they were about eight or nine years old, they asked me if they could drive the car. And I'm like, well, you can't be worse than your mom, all right? So yeah, come on, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. If you tell her that, I'm gonna punch you in the throat, all right? So. She's not in here right now, so I can say that, all right? So, but no, seriously, the point is, as a parent, you know that there are some things that you know that your kids don't know, right? I mean, there are things you know that they don't know, and yet they think they know, right? They think they know everything most of the time, and it's the same way in our relationship with God. Beware of trusting in your perspective and wisdom, especially, listen, especially, when things are tough, when you got problems. You know what happens to us? We just want to throw our hands up in the air and like, well, if that's the way you're going to treat me, because, you know, hadn't I been good? Hadn't I gone to church? Hadn't I given some money? You ever stop to think about how ridiculous it is for us to tell God how good we are? I mean, he is the... God of gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. He is the personification of holiness. He is the very thing that defines what is right and wrong. And yeah, I want to tell God how good I am. Are you serious? Um, so beware of trusting in your own perspective and wisdom. Beware of trusting in your own strength. He said there, don't let the wise man or the mighty man boast in his might. Zechariah 4, 6, it is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Trust in God, not your own strength. And then he says, beware of trusting in your possessions. He says, let not the rich man boast in his riches. You know what I've learned? That no matter how much money you have, you can have a mentality that says God is a generous God that takes care of me and provides all. I'm going to trust him. Or you can have the poverty mentality. Now, the poverty mentality has nothing to do with the number of zeros on your bank account. The poverty mentality has the idea that there will never be enough. There'll never be enough. And, and that's where greed comes in because it's like, uh, it's not enough. I want more and more and more. Now, am I against having nice things? No, I hope every one of you can be rich, okay? But listen closely. If you trust in your possessions, you're going to have problems. Because God said, don't let the man who has a lot trust in that. It can be taken away like that. I don't care how much money you have. You cannot prepare for every eventuality. You need to understand that. Um, you got to trust God. I heard a pastor one time that had a billionaire with a B, billionaire who's a member of his church. And he had their permission to share this, but this billionaire couple 
they talked about how if they you know how much longer they were going to work and how much more money they were going to get in the bank and how much more they were going to get so that they can cover all their bases a freaking billion dollars is what they had and yet they were like well we may not have enough now i don't know what that's like to have a billion dollars but i'm willing to try it okay just to see i mean you know I'm sure you are too, but the point is this. Don't trust in your riches. Don't trust in your possessions. That's not what's going to deliver you. And then here's the third thing. God wants me to boast in him. So so notice the progression. I get the word of God in my life. I, I get it and understand what pride is, how it hinders my relationship with God. And I begin to understand that the Bible tells me to look clearly at life. It doesn't matter how much money I've got. It doesn't matter how many degrees I have or how wise I think I am. It doesn't matter how strong I am. You can't trust in that. And then God says, he wants me to boast in him. Let's, let's read that again. He said, but him, let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. Now, what does that mean? The understanding that's a relationship with God. If you have an understanding, and once again, this is not trying to suggest that as a person who has a finite mind that you can fully comprehend an infinite God. That's not what he's saying. But you can know what God is like. If you have this picture of God as he is the colossal killjoy up in heaven with the big stick waiting to whap you upside the head every time you get out of line, you've got the wrong view of God. That's not who God is, okay? He says, boast in this, that I am the Lord, and you know me, that you understand me. You know what that means? His grace. That you understand that God is a God of grace. You say, well, you know, uh, what if I don't deserve it? That's why it's called grace. You don't earn it. You don't do anything to deserve it. You don't do anything to keep it. God gives it freely. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, for by grace... Are you saved through faith? It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You see, how intolerable would it be in heaven if we could earn our way there? I mean, you'd be next door to some blowhard that just talked about how good they were and how many times they went to church and blah, 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 blah. No, we don't get to boast. It's God. It's what he does. He said, you want to boast in something? Boast in my grace. Boast that you know who I am. He said, boast that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love. That's his grace. Justice. Just be thankful that God always does right. Now, I realize that there are questions, and there's certainly nothing wrong with having questions in life. And there are some things I don't have the answer to, and I can't wait to ask God when I get to heaven, okay? So can we all admit that? You're not going to have the answers to every question in life. You're not going to have every I dotted and every T crossed. By the way, if you're waiting on that before you become a follower of Christ, before you give your life to Christ, before you begin this relationship with Jesus, you're never going to do it. You know why? Because there are some things in life that you're just not going to have the answers to. That's why the Bible calls it faith. God doesn't call us to blind faith. He says without, that faith is the, uh, the hope of things, uh, it's the evidence of things uh, hoped for. Well, Hebrews 11, uh, 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All right? So there's, there's substance to it. There's evidence. I get tickled at people that claim that they're atheists. And I say claim because somebody to make a bold assertion that there is a God and they know it for sure is mighty arrogant. That's saying, I know everything there is to know in the universe. I can at least respect intellectually a person that says I'm an agnostic. I don't know or I don't believe. I get that, okay? But God doesn't expect you to check your brain at the door when you become a follower of Jesus Christ. There's evidence. And the truth is, If you say, well, I'm a person that follows the evidence. I don't follow that stuff in the Bible, that funny stuff in the Bible, you know, written by man or whatever. Well, 
don't tell on yourself because if you say the evidence is what I go by, the pile of evidence that there is a God is like this. The pile of evidence that there is no God is like way down here. Okay? So if you're going to follow the evidence, just like Hebrews 11 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. He said, rejoice that I do right. Rejoice that uh, there's righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So he tells me to boast and praise God. The word boast there means to praise and have joy in. Okay? To praise and have joy. You know what he's saying? Praise God. Have joy in your relationship with him. That's what we should be thankful for. He says that I can praise God that he's good. That I can praise God that he has grace. That I can praise God that he is just. The antidote to pride is humility that comes from seeing God for who he is. You see, when you really begin to see him, when you really begin to understand who he is, and when you see him for who he is, you don't really have a problem with pride. Um, Most of you know that I love college basketball. I'm a big basketball fan. And I played basketball for years, high school, college, and then played in leagues and stuff for a long, long time until I got too old to do it. And um, I, I remember playing in a league several years ago, in fact, before we started this church. Um, and one of the members of the league, there were a couple of former NBA players in that league. And uh, Cliff Levingston, some of you are old enough to remember him. He played for the Atlanta Hawks, played for the Chicago Bulls. About six foot nine, something like that. And... Um, I was like, you know, playing, and, and I'm, you know, once again, ego was never, a, a lack of ego was never my problem, all right, especially in everything in life, pretty much. But um, I remember thinking that I was good. I'm talking about good, good basketball player. I mean, I could shoot, I could handle the ball, I could play defense, I was willing to pass, you know, which is unusual in a rec league, uh, you know, I was willing to pass the ball off to somebody, and I remember Cliff Levingston was playing on the other team. And I was at the three-point line. And Cliff Levingston was under the basket. Now, once again, played in the NBA, and I would not seen him make a shot. He was taking all these outside shots, and I'm like, how in the world did that guy play in the NBA? And I was at the three-point line. He was in the paint, and I was taking my time, I admit, okay, to shoot this three-point shot and I kind of wound up, and I released the ball, and he blocked my shot. He was under the basket. I was at the three-point line. And it immediately came to my mind, oh, that's why he made the NBA, right? Now, you know what I did not have a problem with when I was playing with him? Ego. Thinking I was better than him because I knew I was in the presence of a guy that was one at least one time at one time one of the world's elite athletes, and I didn't like around Cliff Levingston. You know what I didn't do? I didn't talk about how many points a game I scored and how all this stuff. You know why? Because when I stood in the presence of someone that was truly great at the game of basketball, it was no problem for me to be humble. It was no problem for me. You know why? I saw how good he was, and therefore, it impacted my attitude. When you begin to see God for who he is, when you begin to focus on Jesus Christ, you don't have a problem letting go of the pride. You don't have a problem with humility. You know why? Because when you see him for who he really is, it makes all the difference in the world. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Humility is not denying God's gifts and blessings. You don't have to be that person that walks around acting like God's never blessed you with anything. Humility is not putting yourself down, but using what God has given you for his glory These people that want to walk around and act like they're humble because they put themselves down, that's not humility. Humility is not a lack of desire or godly ambition. Some people think that 
Humility means you can have no goals in life or you can have no desire to get better or you have no desire to, you know, increase your bank account. No, that's not humility. Humility is not the pursuit of mediocrity. You need to understand that. But what God says to us, he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Heavenly Father, help us today to recognize that you alone should be worshiped. God, help us to be willing to say yes to you. Help us to be willing to receive your grace, to revel in your glory, your goodness, your greatness. And God, give us the ability to be able to trust you, to be able to humble ourselves and come to you. Before I finish my prayer with your head bowed still, What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Do you need to repent of the sin of pride? I know I've even preparing this message. I had to repent. Now, don't be afraid of the word repent. It means to agree with God. It means to change your mind. It's one of the greatest gifts God has given us. The ability to think like he does. The ability to change. The ability to understand that God is a God of second chances. What is the Lord saying to you? And then I would ask this question. Do you need to receive Christ? Don't let pride keep you from being saved. I, the church that I worked in in Florida before we came here, moved to Georgia. I was on staff there, and the pastor's wife came forward one night in a service. And she got saved, and she let everybody know it. And everybody was shocked. They were like, what in the world? And she said this, and they, they kind of let her speak. She said, I'm not going to go to hell for my husband or anybody else. And she talked about how for years she had just kind of played the game and pretended she had done what good pastor's wives do, but that she had never turned her life to Jesus Christ. Don't let pride keep you from God. If today you need to receive Christ, why don't you pray something like this in your heart? Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God that you died on the cross and rose from the grave for me. I'm committing my life to you right now. I'm asking you to save me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer online, please mark it at the bottom of the page and let us know. If in the room today you prayed to receive Christ, please, before you leave, please do this. Take that red next step card or whatever color that is, uh, I've been corrected before that it's not red, it's whatever, I don't know, some kind of salmon or fuchsia or something. I don't know what it is, but uh, I'll just call it red. So you take that card and put your name on it that you prayed to receive Christ and check that box that you prayed to receive Christ. And then drop it on your way out today in the box, okay? Or you can give it to me. I'll be hanging around uh, up front if you'd like to talk to me afterwards. But our point is this. Don't leave here without letting someone know that you've prayed to receive Christ.